Good morning. I'm not going to be able to do this. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. If, if you can find your way to a seat, we want to start on time. Something we really like to do at Living Beyond Breast Cancer is start on time. If you have an extra seat at your table, do you want to raise your hand so people can easily find a place? All right, so I'm just going to start talking. Hopefully you'll listen. Um, I'm Jean Sachs. I'm the CEO of Living Beyond Breast Cancer. And I am really pleased to welcome all of you um, to our eighth annual conference for living wi living, women living with metastatic breast cancer. Um, this is a really important program for us. Um, we have been working hard really since the beginning um, to make sure that our programs and services are accessible to all stages and all ages. Um, and we know for women who are diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, they need time to be together and they need programs that are specific to their issues. So today's conference is really just one of the many programs that we do. So don't think when you leave today, that's all we're doing. We're here for you throughout the year and as long as you get our emails, which I hope aren't too many, um, you'll have a sense of what we're doing. Um, so please stay in touch. I just want to start by reminding everyone of Living Beyond Breast Cancer's mission, which is to connect people impacted by breast cancer with trusted information and a community of support. Um, that is a new mission that the board and the staff developed this summer, and it ties into our vision, which is sort of where we eventually want to get to, which is a world where no one impacted by breast cancer feels alone or uninformed. And I know for any of you and many of you in this room who've been diagnosed, you know that you need information and you need connection to other women. And that's really what we're all about. Um, and this conference is part of putting our mission into action. So it's gonna be a great day. We have incredible speakers that have flown in from around the country um, to provide the most up-to-date information. We have over 151 people here today on travel grants, um, and I know many of you in this room are those people, and that is because of generous grants from the Komen Foundation as well as Avon. So we should give them a round of applause. I know we have many states represented, but I'm told the states that where we have the highest number of people are obviously Pennsylvania, but New York, California, and Florida. Um, I know I met someone from Idaho, so I know there are people from all over the place. So welcome to Conshohocken. <laughs> I know it's not Center City, but the, this hotel is really good to us. <laughs> they give us a good deal. Um, and you, there are some restaurants, so we can, we can give you some things to do. Um, I want to also thank, as well as the sponsors that um, are providing travel grants, all the other sponsors that make today possible. Um, and many of them are pharmaceutical companies who really are our partners in making our programs possible. And they include Celgene, Azi, Genentech, Novartis, AstraZeneca, Merrimack, Oncotheron, and Tesaro. Um, and many of those companies are here today, whether they have an exhibit table or they they really do want to learn from this conference um, and figure out how they can join with us in helping um, meet the needs of women living with metastatic breast cancer. I also want to let you know that Living Beyond Breast Cancer is a founding member of the Metastatic Breast Cancer Alliance, um, and they are exhibiting here in the back of the room, and this is a group that's newly formed. We're about a year old. We have 20 nonprofit organizations and five industry partners, and we really are trying to work together to fill the gaps and not provide duplicate, duplicate services. So there are a lot of people who are trying to um, better meet the needs. So I just want you to know that that, that is really happening. So we have some video cameras here. We are web streaming this program. Um, so want to let you know, and 
hopefully, if this works well, we will be web stream streaming many of our programs. So if you can't actually make the conference, you'll be able to participate that way. And we do have photographers um, taking pictures. If you really don't want your picture taken, um, please, please let us know. We only use these photographs um, to promote the organizations. We don't sell them or do anything else. Um, I always think it's helpful for the speakers to know who's in the room. So I think it's always nice to start to say, for those of you who have been living with breast cancer for more than five years, maybe you could stand up first or raise your hand. Let us see our longer term survivors. That's great. And how about those that are more like the three to five years? All right. And how about those of you that are more newly diagnosed within the last two years? So the, I just think it's so important that you see each other and you realize that for those new, more newly diagnosed, you have some longer term veterans to talk to. And for those that are more veterans that hopefully you'll take some time to support the, the more newly diagnosed women. Remember, this program is about getting great information from our medical providers, but it's also about connecting you to each other. Um, and it, there are so many more ways to stay connected now than there used to be. Um, you can have a closed Facebook page. You can get each other's emails. You can talk to each other on Twitter. I know Julie is probably tweeting for us right now. Um, <laughs> So please, stay connected, um, find ways to, to support each other even beyond the conference. So I want to get started to introduce our plenary speaker, who is Dr. Julie Grelo. She is the Director of Breast and Medical Oncology at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. She's the Clinical Research Division member of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer S Research Center and a Professor of Medical Oncology Division of the University of Washington School of Medicine. Dr. Grelo has been a longtime friend of Living Beyond Breast Cancer. She has spoken at multiple conferences. She's done webinars for us. She reviews many, much of our content. Um, she has a wealth of information, and she is a true advocate for women living with breast cancer. So I'm really pleased to turn the program over to her. Thank you. Turn that off. Hi, good morning. Thanks, Jean, for that introduction. Thanks to Living Beyond Breast Cancer for coordinating uh, this conference, and it's so good to, to see you all here. I can't see the screens very well, so I'm going to try to keep up with my laptop as uh, I advance through my slides. I was asked to speak this morning about how far we've come, advances in the management of metastatic breast cancer. And I struggled with uh, exactly what to tell you in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. I know we want to leave lots of time for questions as well. But uh, I also wanted to save something to talk about in my breakout session that I'm, I'm giving after this. So uh, let's get started. Um, as I was uh, preparing for this and thinking about how I wanted to relay things, I found this great address by Dr. George Sledge, who's now the head of oncology at Stanford. He's one of the smartest men I know and one of the funniest men I know, too. And he was the president of the American Society of Clinical Oncology in 2011. And I've given you the link here to his presidential address. But basically, he broke down the history of cancer treatment into four stages or eras. In the 19th century, it was all about local regional therapy, which of course helped metastatic patients not at all. Um, in the late 1940s and 50s, we started developing all of these nonspecific systemic or total body approaches. You know, we just made chemo agents, and it wasn't very smart, but it helped some cancers. Um, in the past decade, targeted therapies have really exploded. So we found important targets on certain cancers and developed drugs to hit them. And now we're entering a fourth era, the era of genomics, or understanding the individual patient and the individual tumors 
genes and the composition and what makes them unique. Now, all of these eras are overlapping. We haven't given up on targeted therapies, but with genomics, we're just better defining which ones might work in a given patient and a given tumor. Cancer is, after all, a disease of genes. All cancer is caused by genetic changes. Mutations, deletions, amplifications of genes, methylation, which can turn on or off genes. And the more, majority of these changes that cause cancer are what we call sporadic, meaning you're not born with it, it happens over the course of your life. And only a small proportion of these genes are inherited. Of course, we know in breast cancer of a couple of really important inherited mutations that affect a minority of patients, BRCA1 and 2, and there are undoubtedly others. But most of the mutations you're not born with. They occur um, due to exposures over our lifetime. Of the 24,000 genes in our genome, only a small percentage have been implicated in cancer development. Oh, I am not advancing. Okay. There we go. Okay. Sorry. Just remind, wave your hand in the back if I'm forgetting to do it, because I'm going to forget to do it. Okay. So um, to, to follow up on this cancer is a disease of genes. What are the different causes of the genetic changes? I've told you that heredity is an important but a, a small cause of most of the genetic changes in cancer. But also there are external exposures such as chemicals and radiation, internal exposures such as our own hormones. Estrogen is considered a carcinogen in the state of California. I don't know if that means all women in California should have a little stamp on their head with a label. Um, and then infectious agents. Now, breast cancer, we haven't really found out much about infectious causes, but certainly many other cancers, we have found viruses and bacteria, including cervical cancer with the human papillomavirus that we now have a vaccine to. So you probably heard us talk about omics, genomics, proteomics, different omics. Omics, um, as a suffix, just really means the totality of the field. So genomics means the totality of all the genes in your cancer, in your body. So when we look at a cancer cell, um, we know that the mistakes are generally occurring within the DNA, within the genes. And studying that is called genomics. But those genes all by themselves wouldn't do a lot if we didn't have transcription through RNA and then translation into proteins, which is proteomics, transcriptomics. So there's a lot of omics going on, and some of the changes that can cause cancer aren't actually within the genes themselves, but happen down line. So to truly understand what's happening in a patient and in a cancer, we have to study the whole pathway from the gene to the protein and then what happens beyond it to the metabolism and everything that the protein accomplishes. And the farther we look and the more we enter the genomic era, the more we understand that every single cancer is unique. Now, this gets complicated in cancer treatment because it's not one size fits all anymore. We can't treat all breast cancer the same. And we're going to subset and subset and subset. And if you look hard enough, all breast cancers are really different. So if we go from what I've told you about the different things that cause genetic changes, and then we start looking deep at the genes. This is a genomic profiling heat map where the red dots mean that the genes are turned up in the cancer cells compared to normal cells, and the green dots mean that they're the same or lower than normal cells. This is a bunch of individual tumors and a bunch of individual genes that are looked at. And you can start to pick out patterns of where those red dots fall and where the green dots fall, and you can sort out subsets. This happens to be breast cancer. And looking at it in a little bit more detail, you can see that our current thinking is there are at least five sets of breast cancer. But remember, I told you, if you look hard enough, every cancer is different. So there's hundreds of thousands of subsets. So these subsets right now, we think of as luminal A and luminal B, which are really the estrogen receptor positive subsets. Take this off. I'm making noise for the for the recording. 
I wanted to show my support. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we have the HER2 enriched subset. And that actually doesn't include all the HER2 positive. Some of that falls in luminal B. If you're estrogen receptor positive and HER2 positive, you actually fall over in luminal B. Then we have the basal subset that we kind of think of as triple negative, but it's not an exact match. We have a normal breast-like subset, and the subsets tend to vary with respect to the likelihood of recurrence, the sites of metastases if it occurs, and the response to treatment. And we know that additional subtypes exist. And the longer that cancer is existing in our bodies, the more genetic changes that happen. And so cancers generally start with some mutations that don't necessarily lead all the way to cancer. They lead to increased cell growth or kind of the cells acting a little different. And then over time, as more genetic changes happen, more and more um, abnormalities build up that can lead to getting into the blood vessels and the lymph vessels and spreading. So the more mutations, the more genetic instability. And so what your tumor looked like when it first started, maybe years ago, in your breast, may not be what your tumor looks like at the time of recurrence. And if you have disease in your bones and your liver and your lungs, those spots might all be somewhat different in terms of the genetic profiling because of this genetic instability that's leading to other changes. And that's an important concept that we're really trying to better understand. This is a little bit of a busy slide, but it basically is a, is a bunch of studies that have looked at the primary tumor at the time of original diagnosis and then a biopsy at the time of metastatic recurrence and how similar was the estrogen receptor status and the HER2 status between those two time points. And you can see that there are a variety of studies that have looked at this and some of this information is dependent on the staining, et cetera. But the studies with respect to estrogen receptor show that between 15% and over 30% of the time, the estrogen receptor can change, frequently from positive to negative, but occasionally from negative to positive. Isn't that important to know if we're making treatment decisions? And then with HER2, the discordance in HER2 status between the original cancer in the breast and a later on down the line metastatic recurrence ranges considerably from 5 or 6% all the way in one study up to 40%. So it is increasingly important since the, our treatment decisions totally depend on estrogen receptor and HER2 to periodically re-biopsy the cancer, especially if you're given a treatment that you think should work and it doesn't. You know, why isn't it working? So despite entering the genomic era where I'm telling you we can look at hundreds of different genes and we should be using that in making treatment decisions, we're not quite there yet and we're still very heavenly dependent on estrogen receptor and HER2 staining. So this is what it would look like under the microscope when we look for estrogen receptor and HER2. How do we make decisions in treatments for breast cancer? We take a lot of things into account. So we take into account the patient's age, her menopausal status, her general health, and functional status, or his. There is some male breast cancer. We take into account the tumor's ER status, the estrogen receptor status, and the HER2 status. And increasingly, we're going to take into account a lot more things that we can look at that the tumor expresses or doesn't. We take a look at previous treatments, the time since the original diagnosis, the time since the previous treatment, the response to the previous treatment. If a patient was treated with endocrine therapy and had a very long response, that predicts for a long response to the next endocrine therapy. But if a patient was treated with endocrine therapy and really didn't respond at all, the likelihood of responding to another endocrine agent would be low. Uh, we take into account the extent and the sites of disease and the presence of life-threatening disease. Chemo tends to work a little more quickly than some other agents. So if we have a big uh, uh, amount of tumor in the liver that's imminently life-threatening, we'll probably go with chemo first, even in estrogen receptor positive disease, to shrink it faster, then switch to ER-targeted therapy. And then I'm a professor of global health as well as oncology. I spend a lot of time in developing countries. So this slide actually says our treatment choices also depend on what we can get access to. And in a lot of countries, you I mean, every time I travel to another country, I just appreciate how despite all its problems, all healthcare, our healthcare system is the best in the world. 
You know, we can get all these new drugs, and a lot of other countries can't. What are our goals in the treatment of metastatic breast cancer? Control and regression of the disease. Prolongation of life. Improvement in quality of life, if you're having a lot of symptoms from your cancer. And then I put question mark, question mark, cure, because that's, of course, what we're all hoping for with all of our research. But it is not, sadly, as you know, the most realistic expectation of the outcome of treatment once cancer is metastatic. Although we are making strides here, and I know I have some patients in my metastatic population who will ultimately be proven to have been cured. When we're, um, <laughs> when we're trying to decide about treatments, I mean, it's a partnership between the healthcare providers and the patient in terms of choices and trying to balance quantity of life with quality of life. We've seen some trials lately that have shown a one to two month average improvement in overall survival. Is that enough if it's a very toxic drug? So we're always balancing the quality of life and the quantity of life. And there is good news. This is an interesting study that was published uh, 10 years ago now by Sharon Giordano at MD Anderson, looking at survival from the time of metastatic recurrence of breast cancer patients over a period of years. And so the lowest curve with the worst survival is 1974 to 1979. But look at the highest curve with the best survival, 1995 to 2000, we have even um, markedly better survival. And so, you know, this only goes out to 2000 because, of course, we need to follow patients out over time until they die. So we can't comment yet on patients who were diagnosed with their metastatic disease in the last five years, but I'm betting it'll be even better than this. I mean, what, if you look at this closely, and I'll put on my glasses to do this, this would show that, you know, half of patients with metastatic disease, metastatic breast cancer, in 1974 to 79 had died within a year. And between 1995 and 2000, half of the patients were living at least five years. That's a huge improvement. So let's talk a little bit about the, the, the major big subtypes of breast cancer that we know about right now. So we'll start with the luminal A and the luminal B subtypes. So I'm using this lingo because we're increasingly using it when we do our presentations and in clinic. But for the most part, we think of luminal A and luminal B as being estrogen receptor positive. And you can see those two kind of separated out on this heat map. You can see that the red and green dots really do form patterns that tend to cluster. So the um, luminal A is about 40% of all breast cancers. <clears throat> luminal A has high expression of estrogen receptor-related genes low expression of HER2 cluster genes, and low expression of proliferation-related genes, meaning it's not growing and dividing and spreading fast. It has the best prognosis of all breast cancer subtypes. Now, the luminal B subtype, which is also estrogen receptor positive, is about 20% of all breast cancer. And this generally has less expression of estrogen receptor-related genes, so it's probably not going to respond as well to estrogen-targeted therapy alone. It has variable expression of HER2 cluster. Some of these will be HER2 positive, And it has higher expression of a proliferation cluster, rapidly dividing kind of genes. It has a worse prognosis than luminal A. So while we talk a lot about ER-positive breast cancer, ER-negative breast cancer, we now know it's important to sort out subsets of ER-positive breast cancer as well. We have a lot of agents that target the estrogen receptor. Um, well, tamoxifen is probably the first targeted therapy, but it was developed without having any idea what the target was. We had no idea what estrogen receptor was when tamoxifen was developed 40, 50 years ago. So we've got drugs that work in the premenopausal setting, drugs that work in the postmenopausal setting, drugs that work in both. And it's all based on the estrogen receptor. So I'll just show you um, a couple of studies. Uh, this is a SWOG study. I'm the executive officer for breast and lung cancer for SWOG, which is a big national clinical trials group funded by the NCI. 
So this is a recent trial that we published in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at combination endocrine therapy. You've probably heard of combination chemotherapy, but probably don't know much about combination endocrine therapy. This was a trial of postmenopausal women with newly diagnosed metastatic recurrence, and they were randomized to get an astrazole, you know it as a Rimidex, um, uh, plus or minus fulvestrant or Fazlodex, which is a selective estrogen receptor downregulator. So one group got them both together at the time they had a recurrence, and the other group got one, and then after the tumor progressed, they, they generally went on the other. And what we saw, and you know, this is again, I'm presenting some science in a scientific way uh, to try to get you thinking about how we present. I know a lot of you are interested in going to our, our, annual, our national meetings and stuff. So this shows progression-free survival, how long the patients went without the tumor growing, that's PFS, and overall survival, that's how long they lived. And I'm showing it for the anastrozole alone and then the anastrozole with fulvestrant arm. And you can see that with both um, progression-free survival and overall survival, there was an improvement in the combination of both, and it was more pronounced if the patients had never had prior tamoxifen. And those p-values relate to the significance of the finding. All of these were statistically significant. So we think the patients most likely to benefit from two endocrine agents together are probably those who, when they first recur, didn't have prior endocrine therapy. And so that's our early stage patients and a lot of patients who present with metastatic disease de novo, meaning when they were diagnosed in the first place, they already had metastases, and that's undoubtedly some of you. So this is an interesting twist, and we're figuring out how to use it. We're also looking at strategies to overcome resistance to endocrine therapy. So this is probably going to most impact that luminal B subset. Remember the one that's expressing estrogen receptor, but not as strongly and has some other things going on. So we're looking at categories of drugs called mTOR inhibitors or PI3 kinase inhibitors or CDK4-6 inhibitors, HDAC inhibitors, HSP90 inhibitors. This is an incomplete list. What we're looking at is in tumors, that have estrogen receptor but are not responding well to estrogen-targeted therapy, can we hit another pathway at the same time as targeting estrogen and get better control of the tumor? So this is a slide that shows where PI3 kinase and mTOR uh, link with the estrogen receptor pathway, the HER2 pathway, the epidermal growth factor receptor pathway, and all of these pathways are going on, and in some tumors, multiple pathways are turned on, not just the estrogen receptor pathway. So by hitting a couple of pathways simultaneously, can we get a better outcome? This is a trial uh, that was presented now just a couple of years ago that led to the approval of a combination of anti-estrogen therapy and a drug called an mTOR inhibitor known as Everolimus or Affinitor. So this was a large study with 700-some postmenopausal patients that had metastatic breast cancer, and they had already progressed after some aromatase inhibitor, and they were randomized to get another aromatase inhibitor, exemestane or aromacin, with or without everolimus. And the results are shown here, another busy data slide. But if you look at response or clinical benefit or time to progression, or deaths at 12 months, you see a benefit for the combination compared to the XMS stain alone. And those are very positive p-values, meaning it's statistically significant results. So the time to progression, remember, is the time that the patient went without the tumor growing, went from four months with the aromatase inhibitor alone to 11 months with exemestane and everolimus. Now, you're going to look at this and say, I want to go a lot longer than 11 months without the tumor progressing. But remember, this is the mean. This is the average of everybody in the study. And it includes a whole bunch of people who didn't respond at all and a whole bunch of people who did really well. And right now, we don't know up front who it, it was going to fall in each group. So this is the average of the whole group, including the non-responders and the responders. Now, this is a toxic drug. I mean, I give chemo all the time. I'm used to causing toxicities in my patients. But, you know, this, 
this drug, this drug, you're welcome. This drug um, isn't as benign as a lot of endocrine therapy. And I know I see you waving fans and all. I know you also will tell me endocrine therapy isn't entirely benign. But, but Everolimus it has a lot more toxicities, including mouth sores, which is the main reason I have to reduce the dose, fatigue, shortness of breath, and anemia. But Everolimus, or Afinitor, this mTOR inhibitor was FDA approved in the fall of 2012 in metastatic breast cancer to overcome resistance to endocrine therapy based on this trial. Now, it's ridiculously expensive, and there's this loophole with insurance. Insurance pays essentially, most good insurance, the whole cost of IV drugs. But there's this huge loophole that exists that oral chemo agents can have a big copay. Some of my patients have a couple thousand dollar a month copay on this drug, although the company that makes it, Novartis, has a, a nice plan to help with that. But we need to close that loophole, and hopefully, I know in my state, my insurance commissioner is actually mandating the payers to close that loophole and pay all the costs of oral drugs. And I don't quite know exactly what's happening with the Affordable Care Act. So this is a, a, a proof of principle that by using multiple pathways, um, we can overcome resistance to endocrine therapy. So another hot area of interest in trying to overcome endocrine resistance are the cell cycle inhibitors, CDK4-6 inhibitors. And this is just a busy cell cycle pathway that goes through the different phases of a cell reproduces its DNA, and then it splits in two, and it goes through this whole cycle. And so these drugs go in, and they disrupt the, the, the cell division and the cell cycle pathway at a specific point. So we call these cyclin-dependent kinases. They play a key role in regulating that whole cell cycle of going through cell division. I mean, if your cancer cell never divided again, even if it didn't die, would that be a bad thing? No, because keeping it stable is frequently a very good thing in metastatic cancer. And actually, the longer a cell lives without being able to divide, the more it's going to just die of old age, you know? So um, we're, we've got a great interest now in um, CDK4-6 inhibitors. And in part, that's based on this trial that's uh, called the Paloma-1 trial. And uh, the particular CDK4-6 inhibitor tested in this trial is called palbocyclib. We call it palbo. Um, and um, this was a trial of first-line metastatic disease. So these patients had actually not even progressed in uh, or their tumors hadn't progressed in the metastatic setting, yet they were just started up front with an aromatase inhibitor with or without the CDK4-6 inhibitor. And this is a randomized phase two study, so it's not a big number of patients. It's not a full study for approval, but it's comparing the, the aromatase inhibitor alone with or without this, um, this CDK4-6 inhibitor, and you can see these curves for progression-free survival clearly favor that blue arm, which is the combination. Those patients are going much longer without progressing. And so based on this, um, the response rate was 45% for the combination, 31% for um, the aromatase inhibitor alone, and the median progression-free survival went from 7.5 months to 26.1 months. So you're going to look at that and say, well, that makes me a little happier, but I still want to go longer than 26 months without progressing, but this is more in a range that looks pretty powerful, right? So in April of 2013, the FDA approved this drug for breakthrough therapy track, meaning that it could have earlier endpoints at which they would try to get the drug to the patient sooner with a requirement then that you do more work to follow. And just a couple of months ago, it was announced in a press release that the Paloma 1 trial kind of met its primary endpoint. And so we're looking for a lot of activity going on here um, as the FDA looks at this and they get their big um, randomized phase 3 trial up and going and everything. But we're hoping that this drug is going to be able to get um, you're going to be able to get access to it in the near future. So let's move on from the luminal A and B, the ER positive breast cancer, to the HER2 subtype. And he here I've shown what that pattern looks like when we do our genomic profiling. 
The HER2 subtype is only 10 to 15 percent of breast cancers. And you, you probably, if you're HER2 positive, know that more like 20 to 25 percent of breast cancers are HER2 positive. But this HER2 subtype is, is defined as being ER negative and HER2 positive. It has a high expression of HER2 and proliferation gene clusters, low expression of estrogen receptor. And um, before HER2 targeted therapy, this subtype had a very poor prognosis. But it's been markedly affected by advances in HER2 directed therapy. Right now, we have four FDA approved drugs with HER2 as a target. And the first being trastuzumab or Herceptin, then Lipatinib or Ticurb, which is the only oral um, one in this group, uh, then uh, Pertuzumab, another anti HER2 antibody, and TDM1, which is actually trastuzumab or Herceptin, which is conjugated to chemo. So it's, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but another cool idea. Pertuzumab, in the, the antibody in green here, was just recently FDA approved, and it has a complementary mechanism of action with the other antibody, trastuzumab or Herceptin. They bind to different sites on the HER2 molecule. And it works both by binding to the HER2 molecule and changing the signaling. So it shuts down that HER2 growth factor, says don't grow, don't divide. But it also can induce some immune response. It is a humanized antibody. So it can, it can bring in our immune system, too, to try to, to work to attack the tumor. We're not quite sure what the balance is between how much of the benefit to both trastuzumab and pertuzumab are from an immune standpoint versus directly um, uh, you know, working on the, the HER2 receptor. Here's the trial that led to the initial approval of pertuzumab in uh, early, the, the first line setting of metastatic breast cancer, a pretty simple trial of what was considered pretty much standard of care at the time, which was chemo, in this case docetaxel or taxotere, with trastuzumab, with or without adding the second antibody, pertuzumab. So one of the arms, the experimental arm, has both the pertuzumab and trastuzumab antibodies to HER2. And here are the results of this trial, the Cleopatra trial. And um, over on the right side, you see the, the triplet chemo with the two antibodies. And on the left side, you see the results of just the taxane chemo and trastuzumab. And progression-free survival, how long the patients went without um, the tumor growing, went from 12.4 months to 18.5 months. The response rate was really quite high for both, almost 70%, but it went up to 80% with all three drugs. And then deaths at 19 months were less in, in the triplet arm. Uh, pertuzumab does cause some side effects. It can cause some diarrhea, rash, inflammation of the, the mucosa, the, the lining of the mouth and the gut. It can increase febrile neutropenia, which is where you get, when your blood counts are low, you get a fever, and it can increase dry skin. But there didn't seem to be in this trial any increase in heart events, which is the major side effect of a lot of these HER2 targeted therapies. So pertuzumab was FDA approved in June of 2012 in the metastatic setting. Now my question is, this is a great antibody. We're excited about it. But it's also very expensive. And there's actually been some papers published recently identifying a new toxicity of all these targeted therapies that they're calling financial toxicity. <laughs> and this is a case where if this were a cheap drug, we would give it to everybody. But most of the world can't afford it. And, um, and actually, we should probably be working really hard. And it's not that it hasn't been looked at in this trial, believe me. We should be figuring out who are the 70% who seem to have a great response without adding the pertuzumab, and who are the, those, you know, the extra who need both antibodies, and then pay all that extra money for the second antibody in the subset that really needs it. So here's another new um, HER2-targeted approach. So it's taking trastuzumab, which is Herceptin, and then linking it to chemo. And so this is the, um, the most recently approved uh, drug in treating HER2-positive breast cancer. The chemo is emtanzine or mertanzine. It was really, really toxic 
when they tested it all by itself in humans. And so even though it killed cancer cells really well, it also like killed the patients. Um, or it was really toxic in the patients. So they shelved it because it was too toxic. But if you link it to the antibody and you just give a little bit of this drug and it's delivered straight to the tumor cell and it gets internalized into the tumor cell, it's a really toxic chemo inside that tumor cell. So that's why they chose it. This is the Amelia trial um, that looked at what was then standard of care Cape Cytobiner Zalota with Lapatinib or Ticurb, that was what was approved after patients' um, tumors had progressed in the metastatic setting if they were HER2 positive, and they then compared that combination to TDM1. So that's the AMELIA trial. And here's the results. So these curves show progression-free survival with the blue curve, which is um, Lapatinib and Cape Cytobine. Uh, sorry, the blue curve, which is TDM1, being superior to the red curve, which is lapatinib and uh, Cape Cytobine, for both progression-free survival and overall survival. So um, there was about a three-month prolongation of progression-free survival. And um, at the point that they first showed this, we actually hadn't even reached the median overall survival yet. That means that half of the patients in the, that arm hadn't died yet, which is great. Um, so um, this drug was approved by the FDA in March of 2013 in tumors that had already progressed on trastuzumab or Herceptin. So what about uh, what we call triple negative breast cancer? We kind of, most triple negative breast cancers fall in this group by genomic profiling that we call the basal subtype. And again, you can see how this group that I've outlined in white here really kind of stands out with a different pattern of red and green. So what is basal uh, breast cancer? Well, it's about 15 to 20 percent of all breast cancers. It has a low expression of the luminal and the HER2 clusters. So it's typically ER negative, PR negative, HER2 negative, or triple negative. And while most triple negative tumors are basal-like and most basal-like tumors are triple negative, there's up to a 30% discordance because, again, you look hard enough in every cancer and it's unique. And so funny patterns can show up. Um, there's a high expression of proliferation cluster genes. These are virtually always high-grade aggressive tumors and they have widespread genomic instability, meaning these are the tumors that are most likely, if you biopsy multiple sites of distant recurrence, to be different in different places. Um, now, is triple negative breast cancer positive for anything? Um, it does have high expression of the epidermal growth factor receptor, and there are some unique basal cluster genes. Um, basal subtype is very common in BRCA1 uh, mutation carriers. Over 80% of breast cancers that arise in BRCA1 mutation carriers are basal subtype. It's overrepresented in premenopausal women and African American and African African women. Uh, it has a poor prognosis. It's generally sensitive to chemo, but again, there are subtypes within basal that are very resistant to chemo. And it is associated with DNA repair defects, and so an enzyme called PARP1 is commonly increased, and we'll get to that in a minute, why that might be important. This is a very interesting paper out of Vanderbilt that was published a couple of years ago that suggests that the basal subtype, the triple negative subtype of breast cancer, is actually six subtypes in and of itself. Pretty interesting. I told you if we look hard enough, every cancer is different. And those six subtypes of triple negative breast cancer have different sensitivity to different chemo and different targeted therapies. So. The current thinking is that there's a basal-like 1 and a basal-like 2 subtype with high expression of cell cycle and DNA response genes. Remember CDK4-6 inhibitors we're looking at to overcome endocrine resistance? There could be a role here, too. And they're more responsive to platinum chemotherapy, which doesn't work very well with most breast cancers, but may play a role here. There's an immunomodulatory subtype that might be more, seems to have a lot of immune cells in it that might be more responsive to immune approaches. 
There's a mesenchymal and a mesenchymal stem cell-like set of subtypes, which are enriched with genes that, that basically, we call it, uh, they go from an epithelial to mesenchymal transition. So this is um, the, the background cells in the breast that aren't the ductal and the lobular cells. You know, there are a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of fat and a, a lot of um, fiber uh, kind of cells in there, a lot of what we call stromal cells that are holding the breast together that aren't the ductal and lobular cells. These breast cancers look more like a combination between the two, a breast ductal lobular cell and then a stromal cell from the breast. And these um, look like they are probably more responsive to mTOR inhibitors, I told you about Everolimus or Affinitor, which was approved to overcome endocrine resistance, but is there a role here? They might be more responsive to PI3 kinase inhibitors and able SARC pathway drugs. That's another set of drugs, and there's a drug, Dasatinib, approved in that pathway for other uh, indications, non-breast cancer. And then there's this interesting subtype called the luminal androgen receptor subtype. So these tumors pretty much by definition are negative for estrogen and progesterone receptor, but there's a subset of triple negative that expresses androgen receptor. And I just had my first patient that I decided to send for staining of androgen receptor off of a study, because we didn't have a study open, who was triple negative, wasn't responding great to chemo, and now um, I'm getting her a prostate cancer drug that targets the androgen receptor. So kind of cool. It's a rare subset of triple negative breast cancer, but we've got studies going on to better explore the role of androgen receptor. <coughs> So what about that PARP inhibitor I told you about that it's an enzyme called poly-ADP ribose polymerase, and it has a role in DNA repair. And it's upregulated in triple negative breast cancer, and it's needed for the survival of BRCA deficient cells, so BRCA1 and BRCA2 associated breast cancers. And we need a DNA repair to survive. You know, we have all these exposures hitting us, environmental and, you know, all this stuff going on all the time that's causing DNA changes in us, whether we have cancer or not. And we need our normal body to be able to repair that DNA damage. And when it can't, that can lead to cancer. So triple negative breast cancers and BRCA-associated breast cancers tend to have problems um, uh, in the DNA damage repair pathway, but actually many of them have upregulation of PARP1, which leads them, after you give a DNA damaging chemo, to be able to better repair itself. So that DNA damaging chemo doesn't work as well because the tumor's fixing itself, okay? So if you could knock out PARP and so give a DNA damaging chemo and then knock out the PARP, that enzyme that can fix the DNA, you might have more effective chemo. And um, so PARP inhibitors potentiate the effects of chemo damage. Um, and they have single agent activity all by themselves in BRCA1 and 2 deficient tumors. Because BRCA1 and 2, do you know what those proteins do? They are DNA repair proteins. That's what BRCA1 and 2 make, those, the genes make. So you knock out BRCA1 and 2, and then you knock out PARP. And now the, the PARP inhibitor can be very effective even without chemo in that subset. And so the PARP inhibitors are not FDA approved yet, but they're currently being evaluated in clinical trials. And we've had a few PARP inhibitors that have been reported to date. Aniparib, which had a very promising early result that didn't hold up over time when we did the big trial, and it's probably not even a real PARP inhibitor as its main mechanism, but Viliparib, Olaparib, and then some more that are in clinical development look very promising. Here's a trial published several years ago now looking at the PARP inhibitor Olaparib in BRCA1 and 2 um, associated advanced breast cancer. They used a couple different doses, and they showed that just giving this oral PARP inhibitor all by itself, without any chemo, they got a response rate of 41%. And it caused rare uh, significant toxicity of nausea, fatigue, and vomiting. And then here's a trial um, that we just completed at the University of Washington in the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance that will be moving into a big national trial. And its patients with metastatic triple negative breast cancer or BRCA-associated breast cancer. And we gave two chemo agents 
cisplatin and and then the oral PARP inhibitor, viliparib. And this is a different way of showing responses called a waterfall plot, which especially when you're looking for early hints of activity is, is, a, is a good way of looking at hints of benefit. Now, in our trial, our patients had received lots of prior chemo. And um, so we're, we're looking in the study of any hint of response. So what the waterfall plot shows is that that line that's kind of going across, that most of the, of the bars are coming down, that's where the tumor size was at baseline. And if the bar is going down, that means that there was shrinkage of the tumor. And if the bar is going up, which there are very few and the, they're small, that means the tumor, the best response we got was that the tumor grew. And that dotted line is a 50% shrinkage. In clinical trials, in order to call a response, you actually have to have a 50% shrinkage of the tumor by definition. That's just how we do clinical trials. And so when you're looking at new drugs and early drugs and tumors that have been heavily pretreated, you want to get a hint of how many are actually you know, doing better, even if they don't meet that 50%. Right? So this shows that almost all the tumors had some shrinkage. And there's a chunk of them that met the 50% or more shrinkage, and a few of them where they got a complete response that went entirely away. But most of the tumors had a, a shrinkage, even a bunch that didn't have a 50% shrinkage. And the colors are related to who was BRCA1 positive, who was BRCA2 positive. So the reds that got the best response had BRCA1 mutations. But the blues are defined as no BRCA mutation. We tested, and it was not negative. And we get some pretty good responses in the blues, too, right? So those would be triple negative. So we have a lot of optimism for moving this forward in both of those populations, triple negative and BRCA1 and 2 gene mutation carriers. Here's the toxicities from PARP inhibitors. And you know, grade one and two are pretty mild toxicities. Grade three, four are more serious toxicities. Grade five would be death due to a toxicity. So the main grade four, which are life-threatening toxicities, are related to um, the white cells and the platelets. Neutropenia with a low white count, thrombocytopenia with low platelet count. And, um, and so, you know, but remember, they're also getting two chemo agents. So that do doesn't mean that we know that those toxicities are related to the PARP inhibitor either. So what we'll do as we move this forward in the next study is we have to prove that the PARP inhibitor added on top of the chemo. Because could this chemo alone have done just as good? So that will be the next study, is we'll do a study of the same exact chemo with and without the PARP inhibitor, and we'll do it as a big national trial. Now, another approach to treating cancer is to target not just the cancer, but its environment, because we know that the cancer's environment can help it survive, okay? So we can have immune cells that can be helpful um, to the cancer or can be harmful to the cancer. We can have blood vessels that the tumor brings in that can be helpful. Um, we have the bone environment that can be very helpful to cancer cells being able to grow and divide. So sometimes we can target not just the cancer, but also its environment to make it less friendly. And immunotherapy, which is targeting kind of the environment of the cancer, is something that almost all my patients ask me about. And, you know, I started my career in the early 1980s in an immunotherapy cancer lab at Stanford, and that's what made me want to go to med school. You know, I was an undergrad. This was the coolest thing in the whole world, making antibodies to patients' tumors. It was lymphoma patients, and I thought this was going to be huge in breast cancer. And that was the early 1980s. It's still not huge in breast cancer, despite lots of work and despite it being huge in a lot of other cancers. And this is just an, um, a cover of Science Magazine at the end of last year showing that cancer immunotherapy is the breakthrough of the year, but not in breast cancer yet, although we have some new approaches that are looking promising. And I'll just show you one trial that's ongoing in Seattle right now which is part of a big grant that we have looking at. And we've picked her two to start with, but we're going to start looking at some other um, targets and peptides where we give a vaccine, essentially, to the patient. We get an immune response. We pull out the patient's own T cells, part of the immune system. We grow them up in the lab, and we pick out the T cells that 
hit the target, in this case HER2, that we know is on the cancer cell, and we grow up big amounts of these T cells that by themselves aren't really helping the patient's tumor, but we can magnify them in the lab, and then we give them back to the patient. And so this is called adoptive transfer, adoptive immunotherapy. So this is a trial we have going on right now. We know that a lot of patients can make immune responses to their tumor, but not at the magnitude that it can make the cancer shrink. So we're trying to help that along. We also know, I mentioned, that if you can hit the, um, the osteoclasts the, um, the, and the, uh, the cells in the bone that break down bone, maybe you could disturb the relationship between breast cancer and the bone and the bone environment. And we have drugs that can do that, the bisphosphonate, zoledronic acid, and pomidronate, and the rank ligand inhibitor, denosumab. These can help disrupt the cycle of the cancer cell in the bone and at least slow down cell growth and division, reduce fractures and other problems. That's targeting the cancer environment, not the cancer directly. And then we've had a lot of ups and downs in targeting the blood vessels in breast cancer. And we had the um, early approval of a blood vessel blocker called bevacizumab or um, Avastin in breast cancer. And then it got disapproved later on down the line, um, not because we didn't think it had some effect somewhere on someone, but because it was somewhat toxic and it didn't prolong survival. So we still are trying to figure out how to use blood vessel blockers or angiogenesis inhibitors in breast cancer. And I'll conclude with a few slides on how are we going to merge our last era, which was targeted therapy, with the current era, which is the genomic era. They're overlapping, and we're going to keep going with targeted therapies, but the genomic era is going to figure out with all of these different targets, and I know this looks overwhelming, but there really are drugs, you know, in development or actually approved for all of these targets. So how can we use genomics to figure out which pathways are relevant to which patients and which drugs to use? Um, you can now get your tumor tested with genomic profiling for hundreds of cancer-associated genes. I'm just showing you one of the companies that set up and for profit they are, if you send in your tumor sample, they'll look at a couple hundred different genes and give you a report back. And the trick is, yes, we can look at all these genes, but which of these changes in the genes are actionable, meaning we actually have a drug somewhere that we could use in response to this knowledge. So we're kind of at our infancy, and uh, most insurance right now, in my experience, aren't really paying for this. And we have our homegrown version of this at the University of Washington that we're doing mostly on an experimental basis right now to try to get this information on all tumor types. So, but we can do that. We can do genomic profiling, and then we know we have all of these therapies either approved or in development once we know what the tumor is showing. So this is really, it looks like gibberish to you maybe, but if we know that that tumor has, you know, a PI3 kinase mutation and a HER2 mutation and a MEK mutation, then we could come up maybe with a cocktail and aim for all three of those. So how do we merge this together? Well, one of the biggest efforts that's going on right now is our National Cancer Institute is working with all of the national cooperative groups like SWOG, the one that I um, am the executive officer over breast and lung for, and we're working on ways to do that genomic profiling, that's where it says genetic sequencing, and get it done fast, and then find an actionable mutation meaning something that we have a drug somewhere. It doesn't have to be approved. The NCI is working on getting all the pharmaceutical companies to work together with their drugs in development and give us access to those drugs if we find a mutation. And then we, we give the patient that drug. And then we follow it out. We see who responds and who doesn't. And then uh, if the tumor progresses and they have another actionable mutation, they get another drug. And this is for all tumor types. This isn't breast specific. But we're going to um, start this up. It's at far along in development, and it's very exciting. Um, and so it will allow us to, um, with appropriately selected patients, get sooner access to experimental drugs, some of which probably won't work. But you know, it'll at least get us access and get experience uh, with these drugs. 
And we've started our own mini version of this kind of a trial at the University of Washington in Seattle, and we picked triple negative breast cancer as our first project where we have a patient, and it says here, high quality tissue procurement. We are gonna biopsy as many metastatic sites as are accessible and the patient lets us so that we can get the sense of that difference between what's the bone look like, what's the liver look like, what's the lung look like. We're gonna process it, and then we have an omics tumor board where you know, it costs us $100,000 a patient to do everything we're doing to the tumors, okay? It, it'll get much cheaper. It will get much cheaper over time, and it's all research. I mean, we're not charging the patient, but we need donors, by the way. Um, and, um, and then we have a tumor board where we have you know, the basic science guys showing their results of what they've done with the tumor. We've got the clinicians who are treating the patients. We've got the ethicists involved because of all the genetic issues and the implications of it all. And then we try to go to bat for the patient and get a tailor-made treatment for them. And we've, uh, we've had, I think, three patients enrolled so far. We're really just starting it. And one patient, we found a clear, obvious mutation of a drug that's not approved um, yet in breast cancer, but is approved in another um, type of uh, cancer. And we got the drug company to give us that drug for the patient. You know? So this is our own little mini version of how we're going to move it forward. The NCI match protocol will take it forward in lots more patients with lots more drugs. And I'll just end this plenary talk, and I think we've got plenty of time for questions now. On, um, I gave you lots of data on lots of drugs, uh, that most of which are very toxic, but I want to make sure you know that we're not forgetting about the quality of life component of all of this. And uh, so I like to end my talk with a picture of Team Survivor Northwest which is a group of women cancer survivors who do physical activity in some way to kind of try to help the quality of life and serve as their own support. This is our dragon boating team, but we have groups that bike and hike, and we're gonna climb Mount Adams uh, this July, and I think they're dragging me up Mount Adams this year, um, which means I have to start training for it. Um, and anyway, this is just to kind of make sure that we all keep that perspective on board. I know. You, this group, I don't have to remind you, but I like to end with this slide whenever I talk to the physicians, too, so that we all make sure that we understand all the toxicities that can come from the disease itself as well as our treatments and maximize the quality of life. Thank you. I turned it off, so you'll have to turn it back on. Here, I got it. There. Thank you, Dr. Brelo. So we're going to... Um, have a question and answer period. We're gonna do it in a couple of different ways. You can write down a question. Someone will pick it up and we'll sort through them. Or you can text your question. Do we have the phone number where you can text it? Is it 864-642-2054? I think that number is gonna appear on the screen. Um, so start writing your questions down. Um, I just want to say Dr. Grelo's talk was incredible. She covered so much. I'm sure it was complicated, but I think the most important message is clinical trials um, and how we, you know, the only way we're going to move, there's the number, we're going to move this forward. So how many of you are participating or have participated in a clinical trial? That's great. Um, I think it's, you know, you can see there's so much activity going on, but the only way we're going to move it forward is by, by getting participation. Okay, so start texting your questions. If you're not a texter, you know, I'm not so good at texting, so feel free to just raise your hand if you've written down your question, and we will grab them. Can you tweet your question? You can, <laughs> yes, you can tweet your question to living beyond BC. It's also hashtag LBBCMBCC. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Um, we do have a first question. Um, Dr. Grelo, could you please talk a little bit about um, breast cancer metastasis to the skin? Oh, so good question. I mean, it's not uncommon for cancer to, um, to come back on, on the skin, especially on the chest wall area. 
Um, and sometimes those recurrences can be very inflammatory, like an initial presentation of inflammatory breast cancer. Sometimes it can just be nodules. So um, we have some options. I mean, a lot of our, how we treat the skin depends on what's going on in the rest of the body. So if you have skin lesions, but also have a lot of disease in the liver, of course, we're going to focus on drug therapy that gets through the whole body and get that liver under control. But we can, re, we can radiate or re-irradiate if, um, uh, um, you know, if, if it's just in a, a contained area in the skin. Um, you know, the, 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 the liposomal formulation of a doxorubicin, adriamycin, which is called doxal, um, it seems to get to the skin maybe a little bit more. As a matter of fact, it's a very good drug for an HIV-associated cancer called Kaposi sarcoma, which is a cancer of the skin. So sometimes we might preferentially use that. Um, we've participated in a trial that UCSF was um, doing with some hyperthermia <clears throat> um, uh, to the area in patients especially who couldn't get re-irradiated. And my tumor vaccine group at the University of Washington has even looked at this. Um, we have a, a, an abstract that I think Dr. Lupe Salazar presented at San Antonio of imiquimod, which was like a cream that you could put in the area that would help with the inflammatory response and bringing immune cells into the area. So there are some different approaches we can use with the skin, but if the disease is widespread in other areas, we're going to treat it kind of for the other areas, probably. So we're getting a lot of text questions. I'm, okay. I'm impressed. But um, one question is, are there trials testing diet, nutrition, exercise, and the impact that that may have on cancer progression? Absolutely trials that are testing diet, exercise, Exercise, nutrition. The biggest trials are really in the early stage setting to see if we can reduce recurrence. Because as important as all of those things are in the metastatic setting, we um, don't have as much enthusiasm that they will extend life once the tumor is widespread. So we're, where we're put doing our big trials in that area right now is early stage breast cancer to see if we can decrease the recurrence. But they're all still really important in the metastatic setting with respect to the, the quality of life. And maybe they would have an opportunity to prolong life, especially if you're feeling better and healthier, you can tolerate all the toxic treatments I give better. Thanks, Dr. Graylow. Uh, one of our texters is asking whether there's a benefit to having a double mastectomy if you have metastatic breast cancer. So maybe you could speak to um, surgery in general in metastatic breast cancer. So the, the role of local treatment and surgery and breast radiation in metastatic cancer is somewhat controversial. There were two studies um, one out of Turkey and one out of India that were just presented in December at our big San Antonio breast cancer meeting that said that women who presented with metastatic disease, who lived in India and Turkey, um, and so they had disease in the breast and disease distantly at presentation, did not benefit from doing surgery or radiation to the breast area. Those were randomized trials. Now, in the United States, we have different treatment options. And um, uh, than they do in India and Turkey. So we do have an ongoing trial looking at patients who present with disease in the breast and at the same time it's already distant and we're randomizing. And that trial's not accruing very well because you know, it's a randomized trial. We're telling you if you should have the breast removed or not. Um, but there's enough data that we still believe it's an important trial to do because we're really not sure if there's a role for local therapy when you already have tumor that's distant. So um, one question um, is, what's the difference between taking a brand versus a generic drug? Brand versus generic. Ah, so, um, so for a lot of drugs, they're really, really super close. And in the United States, we regulate the generics and the companies have to prove uh, themselves. And I think in general, generics in the United States are pretty similar, but the filler and the stuff that holds it together can be a bit different. So sometimes you can have a little bit of a different reaction. Where it really starts to get a little complicated <clears throat> is in the area of, um, the biologics, where you can't make exactly the same drug. So the antibodies, for example, so trastuzumab, Perceptin, um, it's coming off patent. And there are several companies working on making 
variations, but because of how you make antibodies and everything, it's not going to be exactly the same. And so we call those biosimilars. They're not generics, they're biosimilars. And they are going to be held to a pretty high standard of having to compare themselves to the name drug, et cetera. And the, the EU has approved some biosimilars, but I don't think we've approved any in the United States yet. So that starts to get much more complicated. And that's where we have a lot more uh, concern, and I think there'll be a higher level of proof. Thanks, Dr. Grela. We have a number of text questions about genomic profiling. Um, so folks are wondering if their cancer never tested positive for HER2, whether they should be retested, and how they would know if their tumor is luminal A or luminal B. So, um, so genomic profiling, so you don't need to do full deep genomic profiling to find out about HER2 and estrogen receptor. Um, I, so, it, so I am on the side of, at first metastatic recurrence, if you can biopsy it, one, prove it's metastatic disease, and two, reconfirm what the ER and HER2 are because it can change. And then after a period of time when the tumor maybe has had many therapies and now it's progressing again, reconsider another biopsy because it could have changed. And I think in the United States, most of the thought leaders in breast cancer are leaning toward recommending not just a biopsy at recurrence, but periodically over the course of metastatic disease. Uh, just, you know, I, I know we shouldn't base our practice on, you know, single case anecdotes, but just last week I had a patient who all of a sudden now with the new biopsy converted to being HER2 positive, and she was clearly HER2 negative before, and now I have all these other treatment options I can offer her. So just a biopsy. Um, bone biopsies are hard, and a lot of times if you do a core biopsy of the bone and you have to decalcify it, it will make the, the staining be negative, even when the tumor's not really negative. So it's complicated to do, and be careful when you do bone biopsies. We actually do aspirates, and we have a very dedicated group where they don't have to get the calcium out of the bone, so they don't have to process it the same way, and we get much more reliable staining. I've had patients who've had bone biopsies that have said it's ER negative, and I said, that doesn't make any sense. Um, and, and we've gone in and done it by just pulling out cells and staining them, and it's still ER positive. It's actually a fluke of the way we have to process the bone. So be careful with bone biopsies. So this question has to do with um, wondering why metastatic breast cancer is always referred to as a recurrence. This person was diagnosed immediately metastatic. So is there a difference? There, so um, the, why is it always called a recurrence? It's not always a recurrence. We, would, we call that um, de novo metastatic, meaning at the origin, it's already metastatic. So we do have a name for that group, and we do tend to study that group differently. As a matter of fact, that whole study about whether local therapy, doing the mastectomy with or without radiation in a patient with metastatic disease, that's aimed entirely for a group who presented with the de novo metastatic disease, where the cancer was already there at the time you diagnosed it. I mean, you know, again, in developing countries that I visit a lot, uh, um, you know, most of the breast cancer is already metastatic at the time of initial diagnosis. So it's not always recurrent. I mean, by the time you find it in the breast, and sometimes we never even find it in the breast, or we just find a little tiny thing in the breast, and it's already spread. You know, and that's going to have a different gene profile, a very aggressive profile. Thanks, Dr. Grelo. Um, our next question comes from someone who's recently diagnosed with metastatic disease that's mostly contained, and she's wondering whether you recommend um, aggressive treatment or a clinical trial, or you wait until there's disease progression. Um, so when do you consider a clinical trial? When do you consider additional treatment? So clinical trials are always a great option at every step along the way if it's something that is of interest to you because right now, remember I started by saying that unfortunately we don't consider cure to be the most realistic outcome. So we always need to learn more, so we always need to be doing clinical trials. So clinical trials are always reasonable. Now if the disease is contained, as in this particular case, um, I don't know if that means it's in a complete remission and we can't see any disease. Um, I don't know what the options are. I mean, if the tumor is estrogen receptor positive, I'd probably never stop treatment. You know, but if it's triple negative and the only treatment's chemo, I might give a break. So it totally depends on the situation. But clinical trials are always an option every step of the way. 
Thanks, Dr. Grelo. And I just want to say we're getting many, many questions. We'll try and get to as many as we can. Um, our next question, um, the questioner is asking if you can talk about the benefits of getting chemotherapy alone versus in combination, and whether there's a potential benefit to changing therapy before progression is clear. So by asking about chemo alone or in combination, I'm not quite sure if that refers to two chemo agents versus one chemo agent or chemo with a targeted therapy or with endocrine therapy. Um, it's probably referring to two chemo agents versus one. Um, and, uh, the, you know, both the European Society of Oncology, which came out with some advanced breast cancer guidelines recently, and the American Society of Clinical Oncology, which is about to publish our new metastatic breast cancer guidelines, were both saying that, for the most part, giving a single chemo drug as opposed to two together um, is our recommendation because you get full dose in, you get less toxicity. Um, and then you can switch at progression. Then the second part of that question was, is there ever a benefit to, before the tumor progresses, switching to something else? And I wouldn't do it with chemo. You know, I would ride out the chemo until either the side effects are intolerable or the tumor is not progressing anymore. But I would, in an ER-positive tumor, if, uh, if they're on chemo and they're getting a good response, I would switch to an endocrine agent for maintenance, we would call it at that point. So there's lots of different kind of scenarios that would feed into what the question's really asking and what the answer would be. Great. Dr. Grayler, we have our first online question Woo! from someone watching online. <laughs> Um, the question is, you mentioned you know that you have some patients you feel will be cured of their metastatic disease. Do you see any commonalities among those patients? What can we learn from them? So the commonalities of the people that I'm hoping will be proven to have been cured of metastatic disease, meaning we eliminate all visible cancer, we stop all anti-cancer therapy, and they live out their lifespan and die of something else. You know, that's the definition of cure. <clears throat> What are the commonalities? One is a setting that we call oligometastatic disease. Oligo means just a few sites, okay? <clears throat> Again, I had a patient, I just diagnosed a recurrence in her bone. It's only in two spots in her bone, it's nowhere else. We are going to aggressively radiate those two sites, and um, she also has endocrine sensitive disease, so we're going to switch her endocrine therapy. I think she's going to do really, really well because we're going to be able to give some local therapy really aggressively to those two sites, but we're also knowing that she might have a few cells someplace else, so we're going to give her other therapy. So we, we have a big debate about oligometastatic disease and whether we should go in and really radiate or operate or something when there's only a couple sites and whether that will ultimately prolong survival and result in cures. The other setting where I know I have a handful of patients who, you know, ultimately will be proven to have been cured are HER2-positive disease, um, particularly patients who have HER2-positive disease that was diagnosed before HER2-therapies, you know, were developed and then recurred in the era where we have lots of HER2-therapies. And I have several um, of those patients, including patients with brain mets and liver mets, um, who have complete resolution of disease. We continued trastuzumab or Herceptin after complete resolution of disease for you know, years and years, and then finally decided to stop it, and now they've had it stopped for years as well. Kathy, you know one of those very well. Um, and uh, um, so that's another group. But I think you know, that's just HER2, and there's a subset of HER2 positive that are very sensitive uh, to HER2 targeted therapy. And there's another group of HER2 positive that aren't as sensitive. Thank you, Do Thank you Dr. Grelo. Um, we have another, our second question oh. from the web. Um, is it possible to see tumors respond to endocrine therapy with one tumor continuing to progress? Uh, so can you uh, see tumors in multiple sites responding to endocrine therapy and one progressing? Absolutely, and that's the one I'd want to biopsy and see, is it no longer ER positive, you know? Um, so absolutely, that, you know, because these are genomic, genetically unstable, by definition, cancer is. And so did that one spot have another mutation somehow and all the rest of the cancer didn't? And now that one spot needs to be treated differently. So Dr. Grayley, we have a specific question um, someone's interested in knowing is who at the NCI is taking tissue samples for triple positive? 
Um, did you mention that in your talk or triple? triple I think it was triple negative. For triple positive. So, Can you well, the question? so the the question is, uh, who at the NCI is looking for tumors that are triple positive, meaning ERPR and HER2 positive, um, as opposed to triple negative? Well, um, the NCI match trial, which will actually be across the whole country, would take all comers, no matter what your ERPR or HER2 are, I, I believe. They'll take a bunch of different tumor types. Um, it is not up and running quite yet. Do I know of anybody who is specifically looking at that triple positive subgroup? I, I don't, but maybe somebody in the room or who's going to watch this live will, and if we have a way of getting back to you, we'll, uh, we'll do that. Thank you. We can absolutely post that information um, associated with this conference. Um, our next question, Dr. Grelo, what is your opinion about the use of tumor markers to monitor stage four breast cancer? Do you see up and down results, especially during any particular kinds of treatment? So what about tumor markers in monitoring um, metastatic disease? I'm glad you didn't ask me about the adjuvant setting because that's much more controversial. In the metastatic setting, um, Tumor markers can be helpful. Some tumors don't shed these proteins into the blood, so they're totally useless, but some do shed it. Now, you, you have to use caution, and these proteins stick around in the blood for a couple months. So one, I've seen mistakes made where people overreacted, and the markers hadn't gone down yet with a new therapy after two months, and they switch therapy. I've also, you know, there's up, there are ups and downs because these are proteins that can be shed from normal tissues too. I mean, CA2729, CA153, which measures MUC1, um, you get a bad sunburn and it can go up. CEA, carcinoembryonic antigen, another one. You get inflammation of the lungs or the, the gut, you get a bad diarrheal syndrome, and it can go up a little bit. So you have to be really careful about not overreading it. So I follow tumor markers in the patients who have elevated tumor markers, um, but I don't use that as the only indication to change therapy. So I use it in many patients to prolong the time until they need their next PET or CT scan. Because if the tumor marker's doing well, then I can hold off. And if the tumor marker starts to maybe go up, I'll get a scan to see, can I prove where that is? I've had some conflicting um, cases where the tumor marker's gone up a bit, usually not whoppingly, but a bit, but the, the scans all still look good. And so I'm not gonna switch therapy just based on a protein in the blood. I need to, to know what I'm treating and see where it's progressing before I'm going to switch therapy. But I find that they can be very helpful. I also have patients with endocrine positive, bone met, predominant disease, whose tumor markers are in the thousands, and they never budge, and they do fine, and the disease is stable. And over time, we just learn not to freak out about tumor markers that are 3,000. And I've had several patients who have died of old age with tumor markers of 3,000, not of their breast cancer. So we also have to get comfortable that, you know, elevated tumor markers by themselves don't have to be a bad thing. Thanks, Dr. Grelo. Our next question comes from a premenopausal woman who's asking whether there's evidence to support the removal of ovaries to treat estrogen receptor positive metastatic disease. So the question is about premenopausal women with ER positive metastatic disease, should we remove the ovaries? So here's what I would say to a patient of mine. I don't ever want that tumor to see estrogen ever again. Either go on, an ovarian blocker, which we do have drugs that can do it, or get your ovaries out. I mean, I just don't want that tumor to ever be sped up by estrogen again. So sometimes people choose to have their ovaries out. Sometimes they choose to get a monthly or every three monthly injection to suppress their estrogen. So just to follow up with that, because we've got, we get questions about this. So in terms of dealing with the menopausal symptoms, do you find it better for the surgical menopause versus taking the injection? So both the surgery and the injection cause all your estrogen from your ovaries to go away, and menopause is equal between the two, in my opinion. If you, know, if you do the injection, your ovaries will come back. So if you hate the way you feel. I have patients who will try the injections first to see how they're going to feel before they do something that you can't reverse. 
Thanks, Dr. Grelo. Um, this is an interesting question that we do hear a lot. Um, in your opinion, how does mental outlook impact prognosis? So how does mental um, outlook impact prognosis? There's some really interesting research going on about this. And you know, some studies that have shown that women who are part of support groups do better. And there's, I don't know how you do mouse models of this, but I heard a presentation about this um, at, just at a little retreat that we had in uh, Sun Valley a couple months ago about depression and its impact on outcome. Um, so, um, so there's some, some tantalizing data that might suggest that you know, less depression, anxiety, you, you know, you might actually live a little longer. And so there are a few papers published on that. We need to study that more. But there's no question that a positive mental outlook really impacts your, your quality of life. And, you know, some patients have an easier time than others of dealing with this. But, you know, we want you to have the best quantity of life, meaning to live as long as possible, but if you're miserable that whole time, then is it really worth it? You know, so, you, so a positive mental outlook is, of course, something we all want. Um, it's good for lots of reasons. I think that people who have a more positive mental outlook actually tolerate therapies better because when they get their side effects, they, you know, are more willing to deal with it, too. So in that way, I think it might also help. Thanks so much. I'm unfortunately going to be asking the last question. Um, I am so sorry we can't get to all of your questions. A couple of folks are asking um, why some physicians prefer to use CT versus PET scans and how often you should be scanned to monitor a bone metastasis. So CT versus PET. So the question was about bone metastases that makes it a little um, more interesting. So, um, so so bone scans and CT scans, um, when they look at the bone, they really show the damage that's caused and the healing that's happening, not the actual cancer activity. So for bone mets, I think that's a little bit of a more clear indication because PET scans are looking at metabolic activity. They're looking at sugar uptake. And that is a way of looking at what the tumor is actually doing in the bones. A bone scan will be positive for a long time, even after the cancer cell is dead, because it's looking at bone rebuilding again. So, so with bone mets, I use more PET scans that usually come along with the CT scan. Um, for, for cancers in general, I think if I can measure the size, if it's in the liver, if it's in the lung, if it's lymph nodes or something, then a CT can be very helpful for showing shrinkage, and I don't need to go to the extra expense of adding the PET scan. Thank you so much. We... <laughs> We will really do our best to get all your questions answered. Maybe we'll email some of them to Julie, Gre Dr. Grelo while she's on the plane. Maybe she can, <laughs> she can tweet some answers. But remember, um, Dr. Grelo is doing a workshop, and that workshop will be held in here in the ballroom. But we're going to take a 15-minute break. There'll be some refreshments. Um, you can visit with the exhibitors, and then you're going to go to your workshop and then come back in here for lunch. I just want to say I forgot to acknowledge my incredible staff. Um, at Living Beyond Breast Cancer who work so hard. Can all my staff just raise their hands? Um, they're, they're just amazing. And also, I have several board members here. My board chair, Barbara York, Beth Haas, Margaret Zuccotti. I don't know if I'm missing Amy anyone else. Amy Lessig. So also, we could not function without our board. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this morning, and we'll see you all soon. And I need to go check out. I forgot to do that.